expanding six dimensional uh, uh, compactifications uh, uh, of uh, down to four dimensional theories and some symmetry enhancements. So, an important part of this program is to understand some building blocks, and we, uh, we have uh, obtained several building, couple of building blocks last time, and uh, rules how to glue them in field theory. So let me remind you that uh, we are uh, studying these compactifications of an E-string theory on a torus with, with flux, and we claimed that if we compactify on a, uh, on a cylinder with a flux which preserves uh, E7 symmetry, E7 times E1, and this flux is of, of the following form. One, two. Then the field theory one obtains in four dimensions is a very silly West Zumino model of the following type. Okay. Okay. So it's just a theory of free fields with some uh, superpotential. And uh, the symmetry that you see in, uh, uh, explicitly in this Lagrangian, in the Lagrangian which describes this uh, quiver diagram, is SU8 times U1. Which, and the SU8 is some subgroup of E7. So this is an E7 flux that we consider. And the fact that we don't see E7 is because we have punctures. And the punctures break farther the symmetry from E7 uh, down to SU8. Then we also mentioned uh, towards the end of, uh, of, uh, uh, of last talk that if you just take the same flux, same E7 flux, but uh, flip all the signs, the theory should be basically the same. And uh, what you need to do is just reverse all the charges. So in particular, we are reversing all the arrows in this uh, quiver diagram. So again, uh, as we mentioned last time, there is no physical difference between these theories if you consider them uh, in, independently, but the difference will, uh, will come when we will try to glue them together, when we will uh, consider them in this, uh, as parts of the same theory, then these arrows uh, will matter. And the way they matter is because we have slightly different gluing rules when we combine theories, two theories of this type or say, two theories of this type, or such a theory, and theory of this kind. So again, in order to define this factorization program, we don't just need to define what are the building blocks, but also how we glue them together. So geometrically, we can have two pieces corresponding to two different cylinders. Yes? What do you mean you flipped it as? Yes, that's right. But again, the, the point will be how you glue. Do you glue like, like we, we, with arrows pointing the same way or the opposite way? You are right that this picture is the same picture but, but flipped. So again, these theories are physically equivalent. The only question is what you glue to what. Okay? And that's how the, we identify that the flux of these two theories is opposite or is the same. Okay, so the gluing rules schematically, and we will see several e examples uh, today, are the following. So when we glue two cylinders, we gauge an SU2 symmetry corresponding to the punctures. So the, one of these SU2s. And we also add uh, something. So in, in case when we glue two such theories together, in this case two theories of the same flux, uh, of the same sign of the flux, we need to add a certain field which we called phi which is just a bifundamental of SU2 and SU8, and we turn on certain superpotential. And in case we glue such and such theory together, we don't introduce any field phi, but we turn on certain superpotential. And again, we will see uh, many examples today. And finally, we make the use of these rules to derive theories corresponding to compactification on a torus with flux, which is just f, some number times, uh, times this vector, which is an E7 flux. And the theories you obtain following these rules are just very simple quivers with this circular structure. So you have a lot of SU2s on a circle. You have an SU8 in the middle, flavor symmetry group. And then you have arrows like that. And the number of uh, groups, of gauge groups, is twice the value of flux. So 
twice the value of flux of E7 is the number of gauge groups. And what we claimed is that if you compute the anomalies of this theory, then they exactly match what you would expect from six dimensions. And also we saw that the structure of representation uh, uh, theory of the group E7 appears. In particular, all the protected operators uh, of, the th of this theory form representations of E7. And we claim that somewhere on the conformal manifold of this theory, there might be a point, maybe a strong coupling, where the symmetry group enhances from SU8 times U1 to E7 times U1. Okay, so what we will do today, we will just play very, very fun games. So the only thing we will need is just uh, these building blocks, these Lego pieces and the gluing rules that we, will, we discussed. And we will construct many different the theories corresponding to torus compactifications, which have various properties and various symmetries. And we will see how uh, this picture, why this picture is consistent, how it is related to dualities and how it is related to symmetry enhancements. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. So it's a very good question. So the question is, the I I just said that when we glue things together, then I decide what to put uh, here is what depending on on what the flux of the theory is. That is true for these simple theories. In general, uh, this, is, uh, this is not how one should phrase things, because flux is something which corresponds to, you know, to the torus, if you wish, sorry, to the surface itself. It's, not, it's, not cor it, it's something which doesn't correspond to the puncture. What, what really the precise way to, to phrase it is that you need to understand what type of puncture you have. So uh, I didn't want to go into it because there are a lot of different uh, subtleties in defining exactly what a puncture is, but since you asked, in this case, it's when you just complex conjugate, it's not just that you flip the value of the flux, you do something else. And uh, for example, you can see that the punctures are not exactly the same of this, of this tube. Okay? They, they are slightly different. For example, you see that uh, there is an operator which is charged under the symmetry of this puncture, and it is in a, say, fundamental representation of SUA, the operator which is charged under this puncture is in the anti-fundamental representation of SUA. So the punctures are not exactly the same. There are slight differences. So you, what you really need to do is understand what type of puncture you glue to what type of puncture. So there are many choices. You need to classify them. And in this case, it's actually not too complicated. And then the only thing you need to know, which puncture you glue to which puncture. The flux is not important. Okay? In this particular example, you can kind of trade defining what, the, what is the type of the puncture to saying which theory you glue, you glue to which theory. It's an excellent point. Okay. okay, so next thing I will do, so till now we just combined theories of one type. We combined theories of this type to themselves to form theory, theory which has an E7. But now let us discuss what happens if we combine some theories of this type and some theories of this type, okay? So in particular, we will understand how the equation half minus a half equals to zero is consistent with what we just said, okay? So the basic point is, say we take many theories of this type. So we say we take, uh, I don't know, F theories of this type. Then the flux which corresponds to this theory is F over two. Then if we, should, if we glue theory of this type to, to, to what we just did, then the flux which, uh, which we should get is F over two minus a half, okay? But we know what, uh, we, we can build the theory independently just by gluing F minus one uh, objects of this type. We don't need to glue this uh, object of this type. So what should happen is that one such triangle will annihilate uh, such a triangle. So let us see how this happens. Okay, so this is a big picture, so I hope I will draw it uh, nicely, which I doubt. Okay, so we have, say, such a theory. Okay, so this is a theory which we obtain by just combining several such pieces, and we can have many of such pieces. Okay, then what I want to do, I want to take one such piece, 
and glue it to, to this theory. So we taken this uh, tube theory. But now, since it has the opposite flux, this, this arrow and this arrow are oppositely oriented. And then we have, here we have a flavor symmetry. All of these are SU2s. So this is a 2. And uh, we have a 2 here. And then we have something like that. And then let's us glue it to another uh, block of theories, which again have the same sign of flux as this one. So say this has flux plus f prime. This has flux minus a half. And then we glue this thing to another piece which has flux, uh, flux f prime prime. But what is important for us it is that it is a positive value of flux. So there is something like that. Okay, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so we glue two such things together. So this has a flux minus a half, and this has flux plus f prime prime. Okay, so what are the rules of the game? How we glue these things together? So there are two things we need to do, as we mentioned. We need to gauge the SU2 symmetries. And in, in this case, since the lines are oppositely oriented, these are different types of punctures. Then we just turn on a superpotential, which is of the following type, as we discussed. Let's call it this f right 1, this field f right 1, and this fl2, this f right 2, and this one fl3. Okay? So the superpotential which we need to turn, turn on in this case is very simple. It's just phi r1 times phi l2 plus phi r2 phi l3. Okay? And then, what, that's everything we do. These pot, this superpotentials identify the different SU8 symmetries of the different blocks. We gauge the symmetries and we obtain some theory, which we'll draw in a moment. But what are these terms? Okay. Do I identify what, how do you call such terms? They have a simple name. These are exactly, these are mass terms. So when you add such terms, you basically give masses to these fields, okay? You just give masses to, this, to these fields. So in the IR, what will happen is that we just remove all these arrows, okay? So what happens is that in the IR, the theory we obtain is of the following type. So we have this thing, this thing, and then we trade this symmetry with gauge symmetries, right? We gauge these symmetries. And I missed one group. No, that's fine. OK? But now what, what, we can, what we can study is the dynamics of this theory, of this gauge theory. What, is, what, what are these gauge nodes? These gauge nodes are very simple. These are SU2 gauge uh, theories, SQCDs, with an F equals to 2. Okay. We have four fundamental chiral fields, that this SU2 fields, and also this SU2 fields, four fundamental fields. Now, the dynamics of this SU2 SQCD with an NF equals 2 was understood many, many years ago. Okay, this is a little bit funny theory. It has what is called quantum deformed moduli space. In particular, uh, uh, if you want to have a supersymmetric vacuum for this theory, you need to turn on a VEV vacuum expectation value for some a gauge invariant operator. And the superpotentials that we have in this theory, they basically force you to turn on a VEV. For example, if you first identify, first try to study this gauge, uh, gauge group, then you turn on a VEV for a mesonic operator, which is this field times the, this field. Okay? This is uh, some standard uh, analysis of, QC, of uh, these types of QCD done by Cyberg many, many years ago. But if you turn on a VEV, to this composite operator, which is built from gauge variant fields which are charged under this SU2, what happens is that this SU2 is Higgs. Okay? It disappears. You, you give a VEV, this SU2 is Higgs. And when you analyze the dynamics of this, uh, of, this, uh, of this sector, what happens is actually that you can remove all of this with a single line. What you get in the IR is just a theory without these two gauge groups. Okay? 
This is standard dynamic, so if SU2, SQCD with, F, with an F equals 2. But now this theory is exactly what we expect. You see, we had two triangles which basically annihilated each other. So we get exactly a theory which you just build from such pieces which corresponds to flux which is equal to sum of the fluxes minus a half. Okay, sum of the fluxes of the original pieces that we had minus a half. Okay? So this had to be true if our picture is consistent. If, we, if what we say, we're saying is inconsistent, then you know, gluing such a piece, uh, building the same theory only from such a piece or, or from such and such pieces would give a different answer. But we want a consistent story. And so it doesn't matter in, we, in which way we obtain a theory corresponding to the same surface with the same value of flux. And that is how it works here. So what guarantees that uh, we, we, have this, uh, uh, we have this consistent story is the dynamics, this simple dynamics uh, of SU2 theory with two flavors. Okay? We did not put in these dynamics, okay? but it kind of, if we wouldn't have known about it, it should have been true. And in, in this particular case, this dynamics was known long before, but one can think of other cases in other compactifications where such properties of simple field theories appear, which we, uh, what, which were not known uh, uh, prior to these types of analysis. Okay, so this is a very, very simple property, which we can phrase as just half minus half, half equals a zero. So it's a standard uh, Seiberg uh, dynamics. Okay. Questions? Okay, so another thing that we can do is now try to study theories which have different values of flux. Not a seven type of flux, but flux which correspond to some other group. So we have many choices, and let me remind you what I already told you last time. So the flux for E7 is proportional to such vectors, vectors which have all entries which are equal to one, or by using the wild group of E8, we can build other types of vectors where we have only two non-zero uh, entries, and the flux is proportional to this. Then for SO14, we have mentioned that we can do several things. For example, fluxes which have the form four zero and all the rest zeros, or all four twos and four zeros. And for E6 times SU2, the fluxes in this basis have the form of six twos and two zeros. Okay? So how would we build such fluxes using uh, the building block that we have? And it's very simple. Okay, so let us uh, start from, uh, 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 from the theory which corresponds to SO14. Yes, to SO14. And let us try to engineer flux of this form. Okay, and in particular, let us just divide everything by two, try to engineer something which has half of the flux uh, which is written here. How would you do so with the building blocks that we have? And that's very simple. You just take one block with all halves. I hope I can count to eight. I cannot. Okay. And now we add to it a similar piece, but we flip signs of some entries. Okay. So we add to it something which has half in the four first entries and has minus a half in the rest. Okay. So this is exactly a theory of the kind we have considered. And this looks something new, but actually we can very quickly understand what this theory is. Remember that to understand the theory with all minuses, we flipped charges of all the fields that we had in this picture. So to understand this theory, we will just flip charges of part of the fields. So let, let me show how it goes. So this theory is, is that triangle, and let me write it in a slightly different way. How did I draw the arrows? That. Let me do it like this. So this theory I can write in the following manner. 
Okay? I didn't do anything. Okay? The picture there has an 8 and two SU2s. Here I just split the SU8, the 8 into two fours. So you can think of that picture as just folding the, the upper side uh, down. Okay? It's just another way to write the same quiver, just by splitting 8 to 4 and 4. Here I will need to do that, to split, uh, to treat differently two fours, uh, two quartets of fields. Okay? And then what this guy will correspond to, let me write it in a very similar way. So let us think of this four as four first entries here. So this will be exactly the same. So this will be piece like that. But down here, I want to flip the signs. I want to flip the charges. So I flip the directions of the arrows. Okay? So what we will get here is the following thing. The arrow here goes down. It will go up here. We will have a four and an arrow like that. Okay? And now we will want to combine these two theories according to our rules. Okay? So what we need to do is to gauge this SU2. So we gauge a diagonal combination of these two SU2s, and we turn on some superpotential. Up here, the arrows are oriented in the same way. So we need to add this field phi that I mentioned with some superpotential. So we need to add another field phi. Okay, which will be in four, in, uh, in, which will be bifundamental of this SU4 and SU2. But here the arrows are oppositely oriented, so we don't need to turn uh, to, to add any field, any extra field. What we need to do, just couple them together, like we did in, in that example. But again, since uh, the superpotential we turn on is just this field times this field, this will be a master. And what will happen is that these two fields will just mass up and disappear in the IR. So the theory we get in the IR is very simple. It's given by the following quiver. So we have this gauge SU2, which we have in the middle. And then we have arrows going to SU4 flavor symmetry like that. But downstairs, the theory looks a little bit different because these two fields disappear. Okay, so it looks like that. We have a four and the arrows go like that. Okay? So what the claim is that this is a flux, this is an SO14 type of flux, and in SO14 uh, language, this is, the value of this flux is a half. Okay? This is, let's call it FSO14. And the theory which corresponds to a compactification of tube with that value of flux should be this theory. Okay? So now here you see there are, what are the symmetry groups. So there is, a sym there is an SU4 symmetry and another SU4 symmetry. And if you analyze other uh, symmetries that this quiver has, you find that there are two more U1s. Okay? And the way this goes is that uh, the, the way that you, you see the SO14 representation is that uh, when you, for example, will analyze the, uh, uh, the tori quivers that you will build from that, so this is a tube, you, you can now concatenate them together to form to theories which correspond to tori. And then what you will see, like in the previous case of E7, that all the protected uh, states of this theory will form representations of, uh, of SO14. And the embedding of the groups that you actually see in the quiver in, 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 inside SO14 is as follows. So the 14-dimensional representation of SO14, which is the vector representation, is built uh, from 6, 1, plus 1, 6, plus two singlets, where these singlets are charged, uh, they are singlets of uh, the SU4 group, so this is a, uh, in a six-dimensional representation of one SU4 and a singlet of, of the other SU4, and this is other way around, and then there are two singlets of, of SU4s, but they are charged in some way under the U1s, so that's how the group SO14 will appear. So everything you will see, every protected operator that you will see in uh, appearing in this quiver will be either in the 14th representation or 14 dimensional representation or representation that you can get from it. Moreover, if you will compute conformal anomalies from the, of the theories that you can get this way, the numbers we, which you will obtain are just A equals to twice square root times the value of flux and C is equal to 5 half times square root of F. Okay? So this theory, unlike 
the one here, which was free, which was a conformal theory, that theory is not conformal. And there are charges that you will obtain by performing A maximization that I mentioned last time will not be the free R charges. It will flow to some SCFT. And once you analyze this A maximization, you will get these anomalies. Okay? So again, you get a consistent picture. This is rather non-trivial that the anomalies which follow from this theory agree with the six-dimensional picture. Okay? Questions? So it's rather miraculous that this group, this group theory which follows from six dimensions, it's a very simple fact, you know, that you need, you can write, you know, this vector as a sum of such vectors. This very, very, very simple fact gives you, produces, uh, allows you to produce a theory which has very interesting symmetry enhancement from SU4 times SU4 and a bunch of U1s to SO14 times U1. Let me give yet another example. Okay. Let me keep this one. Okay. Okay. So we can, uh, as we discussed, we can uh, uh, obtain a vector of fluxes which gives and the seventh symmetry in different ways. So this is one choice, and this choice corresponds to the theory which we already built, but we can obtain a different vector of fluxes, which looks like that, and this vector of fluxes is related to this one by the wild group of E8. So we can ask now, uh, can we build something which has these fluxes? And if we can build something which has these fluxes, it better be the same theory as we, the theory we obtained before. At least it should be an equivalent theory. Okay? So we play exactly the same game as we played there. Just we now will demand that two first entries in the, in the vector will be the same and the rest will be zero. So we will have exactly the same equation with all the halves here. But here we will have a half and a half and then six minus halves. Okay? So exactly the same game. So let me draw what you obtain from this equation. Let me write it down maybe. So equation which is one and one and then everything else is zeros equal to all halves plus two halves and then many minus halves, six minus halves. So again, exactly the same picture, but now instead of splitting to four and four, we need to split to, to two and six. So this is the picture we can draw. So we have a two, um, an arrow like that. Okay, this is again completely equivalent to this picture. We just need to flip it down. It's just a different way of writing it. And then when we add the quiver which corresponds to this piece, which is given by this drawing, so it will be uh, something which is oriented in the same way. Let me draw it like that. A two, two groups SU2. And then here it's oriented the opposite way. Okay. If we add such a piece exactly following the rules of the game that we have there, the quiver we will obtain is of the following form. It will be SU2, and then we have an SU2 gauge group an SU2 flavor group, then we have a two here, a two here, and something like that. And to have the arrows right, it will have the following form. So it doesn't look the same as what we had before. So this theory should have the same, uh, it, 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 we want to correspond it, associate it to the same type of flux, to any seven type of flux as this theory. It's just different representation of the flux. So here it is represented by this vector. Here it is represented by this vector. They should be equivalent. Group theory tells us that they should be equivalent. They are just related by some wild transformation of E8. They look different, but they should be the same. Okay? So why this type of theory is of the same 
tie as this one. Okay? So if you look on the gauge theory which appears here, okay, on SU2 which appears here in the middle, it's a very interesting theory. So what appears here is an SU2 gauge theory with an F equals 3, okay, with three flavors. Okay? And the dynamics of this theory is very simple. And F equals 3 means that we have six fundamental chiral fields. So I runs from 1 to 6. Okay? And uh, again, 20, more than 20 already, 25 years ago, the dynamics of this theory was analyzed. And it is claimed that in the IR, this theory is effectively described by a bunch of free fields, okay? which uh, map, uh, which, which are basically the composite operators in this UV theory. Okay, if you take UI, QJ, built from them composite operators, gauge invariant operators, then this correspond, the, the, uh, because you have an SU2 contraction, you need to anti-symmetrize the indices. So what you get is uh, 15 mesonic fields. Okay? So the dynamics of this theory is very, very simple. And if you now put in this dynamics into this quiver, what you will get is that uh, uh, in quiver notations, these mesons so, uh, uh, have the following form. So you have mesons, this, the QIs that I wrote here are these QIs, these QIs, and these QIs. So some of the mesons will look like that. It will be just a line from here to here. Some of them will be aligned from here to here. Some of them will be aligned from here to here. And then there will be some singlets associated to the nodes. Let me not write them. So what you can do is trade all this piece, this gauge theory, with some free fields. Okay? And the moment you do this analysis carefully and you close the theory to the torus, you obtain exactly the same time types of quivers you can build from that. Okay? So this dynamics, SU2 with an F equals 3, is responsible for this very simple uh, fact that the vector 1, 1, 1, 1, and a lot of zeros under wild group of E8 is uh, equivalent to this vector. Okay? So again, if we wouldn't have not known that this duality is correct, we, should have, we would have been discovering it. You know, if our picture is consistent, this property should be true. Theories that you build from such blocks at least in the infrared, should be equivalent to theories which you build from such blocks. So there has to be some dynamics which is, uh, which is responsible for this. What is the microscopics of these dynamics? How things actually happen, we don't know. We, we cannot derive from such picture. But again, this has to be true because of the consistency of the picture. Okay. And finally, let me do another example. So what you can get from here, and maybe I'm doing it a little bit intentionally, it looks that you know, what you obtain from this types of, type of logic is something which is, looks rather complicated. Okay? You have big quivers. You have some funny properties of big quivers. Why should we care? Okay? So what we will do next, we will derive from these complicated quivers something uh, very surprising about very, very simple theory. So a consistency of all this construction will lead us to, to say something about really one of the simplest uh, theories that you can imagine. And to do so, we will first uh, understand, again, following the same types of rules, what are the theories which correspond to this compacti compactification? To compactification, which should give us the symmetry, which is E6 times SU2 times U1 that I never write. So again, it's exactly the same game that we played here. So now we will add two ones here. Okay? And we will be interested in E6 times SU2 compactification. So what we need to do is add such a vector to a vector which has two more halves, and then minus halves, okay? So the way we build such a quiver is, in the fo is as follows. So instead of four here, we will have a six, and instead of four here, we will have a two, and the same way here. And what we will obtain is a quiver theory of this kind. It's very similar to the quiver that we had here, 
Instead, we switch between the 6 and the 2. Okay? And this gives us completely different theory because the, uh, the number of flavors that the central, that this gauge node here fills is different than the number of flavors that the gauge theory here fills. Okay? And again, statement number one, if all of this is consistent, then the theories you build from such blocks, uh, for example, when you form a torus, should have any six symmetry. And the anomalies should match what we predicted from six dimensions. And if you remember, the anomalies we predicted from six dimensions are of this type. A is equal twice square root of three times the value of flux. And C is five halves times square root of three times F. And again, I encourage you to do this anomaly computation. And this is exactly the anomalies you will find. Okay? Again, this theory is not conformal. It flows to some SCFT in the IR. And these are the conformal anomalies this theory will have. Okay? And finally, uh, the, one should understand whether one can see E6 representations for, for this uh, simple model. And what happens is that E6 is built from SU6 times SU2. SU6 times SU2 is a subgroup of E6. And the way it goes is that, say, 27 bar representation of E7, of E6 decomposes as 2 6 plus 1 15 bar. Okay, again, this is an SU2. The first entry here is an SU2. The second is an SU6. Okay, this is how group theory tells us that a representation should decompose. And if you analyze the supersymmetric spectrum of models you build from this, you all you, what you will see is only representations of E6, simplest, of one, simplest one of which is 27, which is uh, the conjugate of this one, or 27 bar. And the way you will see it, that always, whenever you see 2, 6, it will be accompanied by 1, 15 with exactly the same charges, same R charges, same charges under the other U1 global symmetries that this theory might have. However, so this seems uh, exactly as complicated as other uh, examples that we have discussed. But now we can do something really neat. We can try to build the simplest possible theory that one can, con one can build using this simple block. Okay? And one thing we can do, we can, just, this is, we can just do the following thing. This is a tube with some value of flux. So what we can do, we can glue, it, glue, glue this tube to itself. Okay? So what will be the theory that which one obtains by gluing this tube to itself? The theory is of the following type. Okay. Okay, I just take this theory and identify the two flavor SU2s and gauge them. So what you will obtain is the quiver which has the following form. There is an SU2 symmetry here. Then there are two lines, another SU2. Then we have something like that. And then we have an additional SU2. Okay, so imagine it a little bit, just fold this picture onto itself and then identify these two SU2s. And then do gluing the, with the rules that we have discussed and that is the quiver that you will get. It's a little bit simpler quiver. Now, this procedure doesn't break the A6 symmetry. Okay, actually one has to be very careful. It's, it's not trivial since this tube has a, in this case, also, the flux is half integer. So this is an illegal flux. When you have uh, punctures, you can get away with, uh, with these types of flux. But when you have a closed Riemann surface, this flux turns out to be illegal. And what happens is that some of the symmetry uh, of this theory, when you close it on itself, is broken. That's what this fractional flux does. In particular, the symmetry was E6 times SU2 times U1. So SU2 is broken. But if you analyze uh, the things carefully, then E6 should be preserved. And still, the E6 should be built from, from this SU6 and this SU2. Okay? So this gluing doesn't break the E6 property, property. So if we did things correctly, again, if the picture is consistent, this more, simpler, more simple theory, simpler theory has to have an E6 symmetry. And again, you can check it. But now that we have a simple theory, we can make it even simpler, OK? So if we think that uh, the, only, the, the way the E6 appears is by 
taking representations of SU6 and combining them with representation of SU2, things which are not charged under SU6 and not under this SU2, we just can get rid of them. Okay, we just can do something to them and uh, erase them from the theory. How do you erase fields from a theory? The same question I asked before. Sorry? This is more complicated way, a simpler way. Give mass. You just give mass. So what you can do, you have these bifundamental fields. Okay? You just can give a mass to them. Okay? There is a cubic superpotential here. So if you give mass to these fields, you will generate some quartic superpotential. And one needs to analyze the flow carefully, and it's a little bit subtle. But bottom line, what happens if the moment you give mass to these bifundamental fields, again, you just erase them. And then you get a quiver of this type. And again, you should remember that there is a quartic superpotential which glues two copies of this field to two copies of this field, such that you get a gauge invariant superpotential. So now it is an extremely simple quiver. And you can actually make it even simpler. Okay? It's the same type of property that we can use. If you look on this SU2, it has six chiral fields. Okay? So this is an SU2 with an F equals to 3. So what we can do, we can use the dynamics of SU2 with an F equals to 3 to trade this theory with gauge singlet fields, with the mesons. Okay? So let us call these fields QI. And let us call these fields Q tilde uh, J. Then the superpotential that the quartic superpotential that we have is of the schematic form Q tilde J, Q tilde K, QI, QJ, QK. This is the, the quartic superpotential that this theory has. But after we are done with the, with the dynamics of this, this SU2 with an F equals 3, we can erase this part. This is just traded with uh, these mesons. And these mesons con contribute to the superpotential. They couple to the theory with superpotential. So Q tilde J, Q tilde K is built from these fields. They are still there. But the fields we had before are traded with this M, gauge, uh, gauge singlet chiral fields. So there will be a cubic superpotential of this form. And these types of superpotentials gauge singlet fields we are again denoting with an X. So what this X means, you just take the, uh, the gauge invariance you can build from these uh, Q tildes. So this gives you 15 fields, sorry, 15 operators. And you introduce 15 gauge singlet fields, and you couple them through such a superpotential. Okay? So now again, if our logic is correct, this extremely simple theory has to have an E6 symmetry. Okay? But now it doesn't get simpler than this. Okay? This is an extremely simple quiver. It's an SU2 with eight fund fundamental chirals. Okay? So it, this is what is called SU2 with an F equals 4. But it's not just that. It's this thing with a superpotential, with, with additional gauge singlet fields and a superpotential. This superpotential breaks the SU8 symmetry of this theory, if you look at it without a superpotential, to SU2 times SU6, and then there is some additional U1 floating around. Okay? But this theory is very, very easy to analyze. Again, it doesn't get simpler than that. So one thing you can do, you can find the superconformal uh, R symmetry assignments for this quiver. And again, I encourage you to do it yourself. It's a very, very simple exercise to do. So for example, what you find is that these fields, the fields which are in bifundamental of uh, SU2 and SU6, have R charge, superconformal R charge, 5 ninths. Okay? It's just a result of a computation. These fields have a, a superconformal R symmetry of one third, and these fields have a superconformal R symmetry eight ninths. Uh, yes, I think it's correct. Okay. 
So now what you can ask yourself is what are the simplest gauge invariant operators you can, you can have in this theory? So one thing that you notice immediately that is that since the superconformal R symmetry of this field is one third, if you build a gauge invariant operator out of it, it will have R symmetry which is two thirds, which means that the meson that you build from this field will be free. Okay, so it will be not an interesting operator. But you can, uh, uh, and, and in particular, it will be, it is a singlet. No, it's not just three, it is a singlet of this SU2 and this SU6, which we claim should enhance to uh, uh, 2E6 symmetry. But then you can look on other operators. For example, you can look on operator, let us call this field QA, this field you call QB, and this field, the flipper field, the field this um, gauge singlet fields, let us call them MA. And what you, you, uh, you can do is look on these uh, sim uh, very simple operators of the following type. For example, QA times QB is a gauge singlet operator. QA is bifundamental of SU6 and SU2. QB is a bifundamental of this SU2 and this SU2. So this operator is in representation uh, two six of the two groups, so it's a doublet of this SU2, and it's in six-dimensional representation of this SU6. And then we have this operator, MA, which is gauge singlet. Okay? It's not charged under this SU2 gauge symmetry, but if you analyze the charges, it has the same charges as this operator, and it is in representation 1, 15, or 15 bar, uh, if you are more careful. And again, this very, very simple operator builds for you the simplest re representation of E6, which is 27 bar. Notice that this operator, MA, which gives you this piece of the, of the representation, and QA, QB are completely different. They, they have completely different origin in the UV theory. This op operator is a gauge singlet. This is a composite operator. Okay? But the claim is that this theory in the IR flows to an SCFT, where these two types of operators become exactly on the same footing. And they build for you representations of E6. Okay? So you can analyze the, the spectrum of this theory in full detail and uh, find that, the, that uh, everything you see, every supersymmetric operators you see are consistent with the enhancement of E6. But actually, this theory is even more neat than you could expect it to be. For example, what happens with this theory is that you can show, by computing some supersymmetric partition functions, that it flows to an SCFT which doesn't have a conformal manifold. Okay? Remember, before that, when we built theories which we claimed have a 7 uh, symmetry, we didn't see the E7 in the Lagrangian. Lagrangian was conformal. And we were saying the following words. We don't, we don't see the E7, but maybe there is a point on the conformal manifold where symmetry enhances. Here, we don't have such a luxury. If you analyze this theory again, it flows to a, to a, to a, to a CFT with no parameters. Just the conformal manifold is a single point. So if there is an enhancement, you should see it. Okay, you don't see it in the Lagrangian, but it's fine because it's not a conformal Lagrangian. This Lagrangian falls, uh, flows to something. But if you, uh, the, if you consider certain supersymmetric fun uh, partition functions which tell you some very precise information about uh, the fixed point, you should see uh, whether uh, the, the concert currents of E6 appear or not. Okay? And uh, there is one very useful uh, partition function, which is called the supersymmetric index that uh, Leonardo has mentioned. I will not get into the details of it. But what you can extract from this index rather neatly, again, as uh, Leonardo was discussing, you cannot really see what operators your theory has. You, have, you can see some equivalence classes of operators. In particular, what you can deduce for n equal 1 theories is that uh, uh, this index contains exact information of what is the number of marginal operators your theory has minus the concert currents. Okay? You just can look at this index and read off this information. 
Okay, what is the number of marginal operators minus conserved currents? You don't know from it what is the number of conserved currents or what is the number of marginal operators. You only know the difference because of these recombination rules that Leonardo has discussed. Okay. And if you compute the supersymmetric index of this theory, what you find is that this is equal to minus 78. And 78 is not a number. It's actually what you can uh, compute from the index is the, uh, is the character of the representation of some operator. So what you, this 78 which appears in the index is some kind, something which you build from fugacities that you turn on for different, uh, different uh, fields that you have, different, sorry, symmetries that you have in your problem. 78 is exactly the dimension, dimension of a joint of a 6. Okay? So what you can learn from this computation of the index, that your symmetry is at least E6. Okay? Actually, to be more precise, you see minus 78 minus a 1. And this minus a 1 corresponds to conserved current of, of an additional U1 that this theory has. So what you learn is that your symmetry is at least E6 times U1. If it is E6 times U1, there are no marginal operators. If it is bigger, then there might be marginal operators to cancel the extra conserved currents. But we don't have any evidence that the symmetry is bigger. So the minimal assumption is that, is that this is the symmetry, and there are no exactly marginal operators. So under very mild assumptions that there are no accidental symmetries for which we see no evidence, this is a proof that this very, very simple theory has an E6 symmetry. So this is something you could discover 25 years ago. This is an extremely simple theory, an extremely simple property. But without all this song and dance, it would have been hard to do, and it was not done. So this is one utility of this approach. So it doesn't just give you known examples, known dualities, but also can produce complicated properties of complicated quivers, but also very interesting and surprising properties of, the, of this uh, very, very simple theory. Now, final thing I want to say is that it actually could have been discovered uh, long ago, uh, and it follow, this type of property actually follows from two, just two things. Under the assumption that, uh, from the assumption that this theory has no conformal manifold, and from cyber duality. That's the only thing you need to know. Okay, and how cyber duality goes. So this theory, say without these flip fields, if you would just look at SU2 with an f equals 4, you can draw it in the following way. You have a 4, an SU2 and a 4. And of course, there is no difference between, uh, between the different fundamental representations, so we could write it as a 2 with an 8, but uh, we, we, we choose to split it, and we choose to split it because Cyberg has taught us that this theory in the IR is equivalent to the following quiver. Okay. A quiver which looks like that. Okay. So we have the same uh, matter content. SU2 with an F equals 4 is dual to SU2 with an F equals 4. So it's a self-dual theory. It's self-dual, almost self-dual. To make it dual, you need to add some gauge singlet fields, which I uh, draw uh, like that. Okay, so this is a known fact from cyber duality, and now we can relate this to what happens here. We can write this quiver in the following way. We here ha have, don't have uh, an SU4 and SU4. We have an SU6 and SU2. So what we can do, we can write exactly the quiver we wrote there in the following way. We split one of the SU4s into two and two, and we add uh, a four here. So this is just some splitting of this theory. We need now to add the bifundamental field. So the bifundamental, so not bifundamental, the, the gauge singlet fields. And the claim is that the gauge singlet fields have the following form. If you add them in this split version, so what you will get is that uh, you flip, you add this, some gauge singlet fields for these bifundamentals, and you add some uh, gauge singlet by fundamental between SU2 and SU4. And for this to be precise, I need to add here another gauge singlet field, 
which does nothing. It, it, uh, it couples to the meson built from this uh, simple field. It is not charged under a 6, so it doesn't uh, change the story. But now, if you use the cyber duality rules, just use the cyber duality for this quiver with this additional gauge singlet fields, what you, what you will obtain that the quiver you will get will be exactly the same quiver. The only thing w which will change is that the gauge uh, singlet by fundamental will connect not this SU2 and uh, this SU4, but the other SU2 and SU4. Okay? So remember that in this quiver, we have an SU4 and SU2, which actually combines to SU6, if you think of it carefully, and another SU2. So you have an SU6 times SU2 symmetry. After you do cyborg duality, what happens? You switch the roles of these two SU2s. So it's like you break the SU6, you take out of it an SU2, and you put in another SU2. So what cyber duality does for you, it acts as an additional while transformation of E6. Okay? So what, uh, well, and this is an explanation of, like, sci an explanation from cyber duality, why this theory has an E6. Okay? The fact that you get the same quiver up to an action of, uh, of, of up to an, some action which identifies in some non-trivial way the symmetries by itself is not a guarantee that there is an enhanced symmetry. For example, uh, we know that n equals 4 super young mills is of dual. If you do S duality, you get the same theory. But uh, the duality does not just act on representations and so on. It also changes your location on the conformal manifold. Okay. The duality takes you from one value to, of a coupling to another value of a coupling. And Leonardo mentioned this property for the SO8 and equal two theories. And the uh, duality group of that theory acts as a triality group of SO8, but it also acts on the couplings. So an additional piece to complete the proof from cyber duality here is the assumption that conformal manifold is just a point. So the only thing which happens is that you stay, you know, in, in that particular point, you have nowhere to go, and the only thing that the duality does, it reorganizes your representations. And for this thing to be consistent, the symmetry has to be an E6. Okay, so this is my uh, final example. So let me, uh, how much time do I have? Okay, so let me stop here.